Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the webinar on responding to the fiscal year 19 solicitation for the Second well, Chance Act. I'm on the webinar right now. The entry for Kinda adults listen. with co-occurring substance abuse and mental illness. For those of you who are on the phone, we can actually hear someone talking. So if you're not one of the speakers, if you could please mute yourself, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Sorry if it was me meeting right now. Speakers for today's webinar are um, Andre Bacia, who's a policy advisor for the U.S. Department of Justice. He oversees the Second Chance Act co-occurring substance abuse and mental illness or CSAMI grant track. Additionally, we have a grant team from Cumberland County, Maine today with us, and they're really mirroring the behavioral health and justice partnership that we like to see in these grants. We have uh, Catherine or Kate Chinchester, who's the executive director of co-occurring collaborative serving Maine, and Sean LaGrega, who's the deputy director of Maine Pretrial Services. I'm Sarah Wurzberg. I'm a deputy program director for behavioral health at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. We're the training and technical assistance provider for this grant program, and I oversee this grant program. So today we are going to go through some introductions. We're going to give you an overview of the Second Chance Act uh, Co-Occurring Disorder Grant Track, or CSAMI. We're going to have the Cumberland County team talk about lessons learned from their successful application and their co collaboration. We'll talk about the keys to a successful application. We'll provide some additional information on resources and webinars available to make sure you get a great, a great application, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. If during the webinar you have questions and answers as you go, you can feel free to use the chat box at the bottom right of your screen in order to ask them. We're going to take all of those and at the end we will uh, read the questions so that way um, Andre and myself can answer them for you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Andre to tell you a little bit about the Department of Justice. Thanks, Sarah. My name is Andre Bethea, and I am the Policy Advisor for the Second Chance Act, Improving Reentry for Adults with Co-Occurring Substance Abuse and Mental Illness, or CSAMI, in the Policy Office at the Bureau of Justice Assistance, or BJA. At BJA, our mission is to provide leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development to state, local, and tribal jurisdictions. Specifically, BJA provides funding to support law enforcement, combat violent and drug-related crime, and combat victimization. Through the development and implementation of policy, services, and sound grants management, BJA strengthens the nation's criminal justice system and restores security in communities. The Second Chance Act has supported over 780 million in reentry services since it was passed in 2008. There have been over 100 awards through the Second Chance Act CSAMI grant program. We are excited to speak with the potential CSAMI grantees on how to build a competitive grant application. This year, we have a local government grantee from Cumberland County, Maine, who is going to tell you more about developing their grant application materials and why they decided to apply for this grant. I will now turn things back to Sarah to provide some information on the CSG Justice Center and the National Reentry Resource Center. Thank you, Andre. The Council of State Governments Justice Center is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. We're a membership organization dedicated to all three branches of government. We provide research driven strategies and tools to increase public safety and strengthen communities. At the Justice Center, we focus on the criminal justice issues. The Second Chance Act support state, local, tribal, nation, and nonprofits organization 
in their work to reduce recidivism and improve outcomes for people leaving incarceration. Second Chance Act has supported over a $400 million in investments around the country and continues to support investments through the co-occurring grant track and other grant tracks that are out this year. Excited to be working with everyone. At the National Reentry Resource Center, which provides the training and technical assistance to grantees, we work to advance the knowledge base of the reentry field through developing publications, hosting webinars, working and learning directly from grantees and spreading that knowledge to the field. We try to promote the success of grantees and others who are innovating in the reentry field. We also facilitate peer information and information sharing and learning, just like you have today with the Cumberland County team providing a little bit of background information. We also provide information to people returning to communities and their families to support the reentry process where it matters most. The National Reentry Resource Center has the latest resources on reentry. There's a national criminal justice initiative map where you can see all of the great things going on in your state or your local community. There's also a directory for state and local reentry services. So if you're planning on putting in an application, make sure that you know what other communities are doing around you because it might be a great resource in order to help you with your application. This can all be found at the website, which is www.nationalreentryresourcecenter.org. We encourage you to go to it to help you prepare for your application processes. Now we're going to provide an overview of the Second Chance Act co-occurring grant track, or CSAMI grants. I will pass it over to Andre. Thanks, Sarah. There have been 105 CSAMI reentry grants awarded for a total of $61 million to 47 counties, 27 states, six tribal nations, the District of Columbia, and Guam. We're looking forward to expanding the reach of the grant program to new areas. There are three grant categories for CSAMI. Category one is for units of state government agencies. Category two is for units of components of county or city local government agencies. And category three is for federally recognized Indian tribes and Alaska Native tribes and our tribal organizations. All three categories are to serve adult offenders. There will be up to 10 awards for up to a million dollars each for 48 months or a four-year performance period that will begin on October 1, 2019. There is a link to the solicitation on this slide. Please make sure to read through it if you have not yet had the opportunity to. The applications are due June 25, 2019. For each of the three categories, the grant awards are up to one million and there is a planning period where the grant can spend up to 150,000 until BJA approves the planning and implementation guide within 12 months of your award. The purpose of the CSAMI grant program is to enhance correction systems ability to address the needs of offenders with CSAMI in order to reduce recidivism and to improve public safety and public health. There is a structured process grantees will go through with their CSAMI grant to develop and implement standardized screening and assessment, conduct assessment for CSAMI and criminogenic risk, provide pre- and post-release CSAMI treatment and cognitive behavioral interventions for criminogenic risk plan and implement a collaborative, comprehensive case management model, create a performance measurement plan 
that outlines who is responsible for data collection, input, and analysis, including identifying and working with a third party evaluator. The eligible applicants for this grant program are limited to states, units of local government, that's county or city governments, and federally recognized tribes as determined by the Secretary of the Interior and or tribal organizations serving adult offenders. There are two phases to the CSAMI grant, a planning and and an implementation phase. During the planning phase, grantees can access up to 150,000 to come and submit the required planning and implementation, or as we call it, the PNI guide. The PNI guide will be provided by the technical assistance provider, the National Reentry Resource Center. You must complete the guide with the training and technical assistance provider and receive approval from BJA. It is the expectation that the guide will be completed within 12 months of your award. A completed guide must include a description of the plan for standardized screening and assessment and of the collaborative comprehensive case plan process, a performance measurement and evaluation plan to include solutions to be tested, evaluation metrics, documentation of the research base for the proposed plan. This planning process is a good opportunity to make sure you and the entire system that you represent have thought through all of the aspects of your program to help decrease and issue spot potential implementation issues. In addition to completing the planning and implementation guide, the planning phase can be used to address the 10 program design elements in the implementation phase. Convene your advisory group meetings. During the planning phase, the grantee must hold meetings with an advisory group of high-level leaders within the criminal justice and the behavioral health systems. Convene planning meetings. Grantees will convene planning meetings that invite criminal justice, mental health, and substance abuse partners to discuss the planning design elements. A planning team should be created in order to increase stakeholder engagement and develop partnerships that will assist in implementation. This can involve creation of a new or using an existing advisory group such as Reentry Coalition or a Criminal Justice and Behavioral Health Task Force. Leaders may include your Department of Correction Directors, Department of Behavioral Health Directors, Chief Probation or Parole Officers, Sheriffs, judges, prosecutors, defense attorneys, Medicaid or insurance commissioners, social service agency directors, correctional health providers, or other contracted entities providing medical services in the facility. Please consider what partners are needed in your jurisdiction. You also want to outline your screening and assessment processes. The planning team will create an outline of the existing screening and assessment processes in the correctional facility. If the grantee has not selected any screening and assessment instruments for, for uh, criminal gender risk, substance abuse, and mental illness, they can select validated tools. Grantees that have validated screening and assessment tools in place will develop a process flow chart to indicate how offenders will, ident will be identified to receive the CSAMI services. You also want to think about creating your case management protocols. Grantees will choose a lead case manager who will be responsible for case management coordination. This is most often a behavioral health provider, corrections, or probation and parole. The lead case manager will work with partners to outline a process for information sharing, case conferencing, and providing access to health and other benefits. You also will be building information sharing protocols. Grantees will develop information sharing protocols that provide guidelines on what information is to be shared with partners. This information will assist with developing collaborative comprehensive case plans and describe the roles of different partner agencies, for example, corrections, parole, 
probation, housing, mental health provider, and substance abuse treatment providers. Select and incorporate evidence-based practices to address criminogenic risk, mental illness, and substance abuse. You have to select the cognitive behavioral health intervention to address criminogenic risk to be provided in the corrections facility. You also have to provide pre- and post-release CSAMI treatment. Provide evidence-based pharmacological drug treatment services such as medication-assisted treatment to address alcohol and opioid abuse. You want to select recovery support service options. Grantees will work with the planning or advisory group to select and plan for a comprehensive range of recovery support services that can be provided through partnerships as offenders re-enter the community. Grantees will receive the options in the community and develop partnerships to provide a range of options such as housing, employment, vocational services, and more to people re-entering the community. Begin performance measurement and plan for evaluation. Grantees will develop a plan for performance measurement and evaluation that clearly outlines who is responsible for data collection, input, and analysis. You will work with an independent evaluator or data lead on the team to outline the performance measures that will be collected in the implementation phase. You should start with the measures already being used and divide additional measures that fulfill program objectives. You will coordinate with the evaluator or data lead to actively participate in the planning or advisory group and to set standards for regular reports back to the program team on process and outcome measures during the implementation of the grant. There are a total of 10 implementation phase components that build directly on the planning phase efforts. Starting with number one, continue leadership engagement through the advisory group as well as provide data reports to update leaders on the process and the progress of building system level efforts to address CSAMI, including provide regular updates on program implementation progress and data, work with leadership to resolve implementation challenges and develop a sustainability plan. Number two, conduct screening for mental illness and substance abuse for all offenders who enter the correction facility, including use a validated mental illness screening tool, substance abuse screening tool, and or core caring screening tool. Monitor the screening process in order to enhance training and streamline referral processes. Put in place quality insurance mechanisms to ensure that screening of every offender in the corrections facility will continue after the grant period has ended. Number three, conduct assessments, including the use of criminogenic risk and needs assessment tools that are reliable and validated and that address static and dynamic factors in order to increase the chances that offenders will be matched with the appropriate type of treatment and reentry services. This will enable grantees to target offenders who are at moderate to high risk to reoffend. You also want to assess for co occurring mental illness and substance abuse using validated tools. Collection of assessment or other relevant information must be provided by the correctional health or other contracted medical or behavioral health provider in the corrections facility to be incorporated in the collaborative comprehensive case plan. Number four, provide collaborative comprehensive case plans, including the utilization of criminogenic risk and CSAMI assessment information to develop the case plan. Consistent monitoring and refinement of the collaborative comprehensive case plan process. Meetings among partners such as corrections, parole, probation, and treatment providers to ensure each program participant has a plan to connect pre and post release CSAMI treatment in an integrated manner. Continued review of the recovery support services needed as offenders re enter the community. Ongoing monitoring of, ex of access to health care and other benefits such as uh, SSI, SSD, Medicaid, veterans benefits, food stamps, 
development of written protocols for reviewing the case plan and updating the information. Number five, engage in information sharing with external agencies. Monitoring of information sharing policies and procedures to ensure that collaborative, comprehensive case plans can be developed and sustained. Continued refinement of information protocols. Number six, the use of evidence-based practices for criminal genetic risk, mental illness, and substance abuse, including provide substance abuse and mental illness treatment practices and services that have a demonstrated evidence base and that are appropriate for the target population pre and post release. Applicants should identify the evidence-based practice being proposed for implementation, identify and discuss the evidence for effectiveness, discuss the population for which this practice has been shown to be effective, and discuss how staff can be trained and coached to implement the evidence-based practice in their systems. Provide evidence-based pharmacological drug treatment services. Provide cognitive behavioral interventions that address criminogenic risk and needs. Provide training for staff and continued monitoring for the implementation of evidence-based practices. Finally, here are the last three pieces of the implementation phase. Number seven, support a comprehensive range of recovery support services. Number eight, provide a clear logic model. And number nine, provide performance measurement and evaluation. The review criteria being used by the peer reviewers are 10% for the description of the issue, where you describe the problem with meeting the needs of adults with co-occurring substance abuse and mental illness returning to the community from incarceration at a systems level. 35% for project design and implementation. That's where you describe the proposed systems improvement and, and the purpose and objectives. Describe how the planning phase activities will be addressed, including the completion of the planning and implementation guide. Address each of the 10 program design elements for the implementation phase. 30% will go to capabilities and competencies. Demonstrate the capability of the implementing agency and the collaborative partners to implement the project included information on leadership buy-in and structure. 15% will be dedicated to your plan for measurement and evaluation in which you will describe your current ability to collect and analyze participant program and systems level performance and outcome data. Describe plans to improve the measurement and evaluation capacity. Last 10% will be dedicated to the budget. Propose a budget for the entire period of performance, including both the planning and implementation phases. That is complete, cost-effective, and allowable. Thank you, Andre. Now we're gonna to move towards lessons learned from a successful applicant. We are lucky to have Kate Chinchester and Sean LaGrega who were successful for a fiscal year 2018 Second Chance Act co-occurring grant for category two, which is local government. And um, looking forward to hearing from them on some tips for everyone else in the field. So I will hand it over to Sean and Kate. Uh, thank, thank you, Sue. Uh, is my sound okay? Because I'm having an echo. We can hear you, Kate. Okay. I will try to ignore the echo. So why did Cumberland County apply for the grant? First off, we had historical focus on co-occurring within our community. And we had pockets of expertise that had been at the table longstanding. And so there was an intra interest. And so then we would bring those people together and say, well, what is, is the need? Uh, and that's how we would start. And then what we would do is bring those folks and say, who else ne needs to be here? And right in the beginning, you need to have some structure of how you're going to approach this. Who's going to take the lead? Who's going to drive the bus? And, and who's 
support do you need that's not at the table? And immediately go to try to engage those folks. And at the same time, you need to start thinking about who's going to be the applicant. In this case, obviously, it's county government. Is the registration process up to date? Is the DUNS number up to date? And then what are types of the guts that you need, like licenses, letters of support, those types of things, and get those things in motion. Finding a timeline, who's going to do what, um, and then monitoring that as you go forward. Um, it's easy to get behind the timeline, so you really always have to keep focused on what you need and when you need it. Um, and for the people that is not in your circle, such as maybe an evaluator, you need to think ahead and get their expertise into that process. Um, and sometimes doing a SWOT analysis, looking at your strengths and the opportunities and the weaknesses is really a great exercise to do. And defining not just what the money will buy, but really what are you going for. The, the money helps to bring people to the table, but there's a, a significant amount of uh, discussion and looking at, you know, what, what really, who needs what to get the job done. So you have to have had relationships with people um, because of the end, um, it really is, can be kind of tricky. Um, if you're just about the money, you might as well not do it. Um, so that's kind of the tips I have, just being, being realistic and what you can do. Uh, identifying your strengths and, and outline it in your applications and and moving towards the completion of the grant. Um, so I think that's those are the highlights. Um, it's it's a fulfilling process when you get done. You say, Yay, we did it and then it's even more exciting when you actually get the reward the award. Um, so I, those are my tips. Maybe, uh, Sean, I, I'll turn this over to you about maybe what's been helpful um, once we got the grant and, and how we move forward. Sure. Thank you, Kate. Um, so I just wanted to take a few minutes this afternoon and really talk about what, what the funding um, that our jurisdiction receives has enabled us to do. Um, and I think one of the most helpful things is that it's allowed our jurisdiction to provide some really basic and critical need to the population that we're entering from the facility and the community. Um, specifically, um, we've been able to assist clients with medication assistance, access to sober housing, basic primary care, access to co-occurring treatment services. Um, we were we were the non-Medicaid expansion state, so we really struggled for a number of years in trying to effectively and efficiently network with client base treatment services um, without main care or health insurance. Um, we certainly experienced long wait lists for our clients. Uh, they needed to get scholarship beds or lots of treatment programs that offered a client DLP services, which is pretty limited in its scope in our jurisdiction. The grant has really helped us improve our work as a system um, I think like many criminal justice systems across the country, um, it's relatively easy to get siloed in your day to day. And um, I think we specifically in Cumberland County have operated with this population in a relatively unstructured um, siloed fashion. And what the grant has really forced us to do is it's brought the system partners to the table in, in a more structured, unified, um, and certainly a more intentional way in terms of working with the population. We're currently meeting as a team on a weekly basis to discuss our pending cases, our client case loads, uh, and work collaboratively on individualizing treatment plans for this population. Really made our work with this group of folks much more efficient. It's allowed us to deal with both client issues and system issues in 
a truly unified manner. Um, I think in terms of next steps for us as a jurisdiction, um, we continue to discuss sustainability um, as we've been doing since we initially received our award. Um, I think once, when a jurisdiction receives a grant like this, I think it's really easy to focus the bulk of your time out of the gate on the planning and implementation and getting your program up and running. Um, but a piece of advice that I think is really important for folks to think about is what, what will your project look like um, in the absence of federal funding? And I think your advisory team really needs to start having that conversation ahead of the um, It should be on each agenda uh, for your monthly stakeholder meeting. Um, and to not wait until you're getting towards the last couple of months and not having those discussions with the stakeholders. Um, that, that piece for us uh, is, is really critical in the work. Thank you so much, uh, Kate and Sean, for those helpful tips. It's really helpful for folks to hear from what has been successful in Cumberland County and all of the collaboration you have really spent years building that's really paying off in the implementation of this grant program. Really appreciate you in joining us. If anyone has questions for, for um, either Sean or Kate, you can also chat those in and we will get to those at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to turn it back over to Andre to talk about the keys to a successful application. Thank you, Sarah, and my sincere thanks to Sean and Kate for uh, sharing their experience. There are a few mandatory certification and consultation requirements that you should be aware of. All applicants must certify that treatment programs proposed in their application is or will be clinically appropriate and will provide comprehensive, integrated substance abuse and mental illness treatment. Applicants must provide official documentation that all collaborating service provider organizations are in compliance with all the requirements for licensing, accreditation, and certification, including state, local, and tribal requirements as appropriate. If the applicant is not the single state agency <clears throat> or the SSA for substance abuse services, the applicant must demonstrate that the application has been developed in consultation with the single state agency for substance abuse services. On the side and in the application, there is a link listing all of the SSA entities for your reference. You must, priority consideration will be given to applicants that focus their comprehensive initiative on providing industry recognized training within a correctional facility. Industry analysis using labor statistics should be provided with the justification why the select credentials are viable. Priority consideration for using the RCT or randomized control trial studies are a powerful much needed tool for building scientific evidence about what works. Next slide. Priority consideration for serving moderate highs or high risk offenders. Applicants that propose strategies to reduce violent recidivism among high-risk offenders under supervision who have a, serious, have a history of serious violence and are identified in concert with local and state, or state law enforcement will receive priority consideration. The proposals must include a description of how this group will be identified and demonstrate access to and use of data and law enforcement input. Encouraging program investments in economically distressed communities, qualified opportunity zones. Under this program, the Office of Justice program will, as appropriate, give priority consideration and award decisions to applications that propose projects that directly benefit federally designated qualified opportunity zones. 
In order to assist Office of Justice programs in considering this factor, applicants should include information in the application that specifies how the project will enhance public safety in the specified qualified opportunity zones. For resources on qualified opportunity zones and for a current list of designated qualified opportunity zones, see the United States Department of Treasury's resource board page available through the link on this slide. Please note that all applicants will be judged on the totality of their proposals. In order to receive priority consideration, applicants must demonstrate they satisfy the criteria identified in this section in addition to all of the selection criteria defined throughout the solicitation. Back to you, Sarah. Thanks so much, Andre. So one of the great things about um, being a training and technical assistance provider for the SCA CSAMI grant track is that we learn a lot from the field as well as being able to provide assistance. And one of the issues that kept coming up was really how to address criminogenic risk and need factors simultaneously with, with behavioral health. And so as a result of this, we developed a web-based support tool to talk through this called Collaborative Comprehensive Case Plans. And this really came out of an effort um, called the Behavioral Health and Criminal Justice Framework, which really was thinking through how do you do these things in tandem. So first you have a criminogenic risk assessment and you look at whether people are low or medium to high risk. For this grant track, we're really focused on the medium to high risk folks. And then you look at their severity of their substance abuse, whether they're low or medium to high substance use dependence. And then you look at their mental illness to see if that's low or high. When you look at the boxes, you have boxes six, seven, eight, which are the high criminogenic risk or substance abuse or mental illness um, and have the co-occurring disorders. And that's really the focus of this grant track. Within the collaborative comprehensive case management model, we think about who's the lead case planner. So who's the one coalescing and organizing the information? In this example, it's a correctional facility. But in some cases, it could be a probation or parole, or it could be a community-based behavioral health provider or another type of provider in the community who's really the person bringing everyone together to have those case management meetings, just like what the Cumberland County team mentioned. And this wheel really shows you the different folks you could have at the table. How is the participant engaged? How do you have a medical provider engaged and at the table? Are there education and vocational services providers? If you go to the website, you can actually click on each of these and it will give you information on, so if you click on peer support, it will tell you what information you could potentially provide a peer support specialist and what information they could provide you in order to better coordinate your case management. We also have profiles for lead case planners, and this example is from a correctional facility case planner from Franklin County Sheriff's Off in Franklin County, Massachusetts. It's in rural western Massachusetts, and they've done a great job with their co-occurring services and really thinking about how to, to put criminogenic risk and behavioral health needs together. So if you're interested in learning more about the model, you can go to the web-based tool and you can also read the profiles to learn more. Within the case planning model, we have 10 key priority areas really to think through and discuss. And you can see that there's actually similarities to some of these some of the processes in the grant because this really also follows best practices. So thinking through interagency collaboration and coordination, what cross-system, cross-staff training you need, screening and assessment processes, case conferencing, how to actually engage the participants of your reentry program, prioritizing the needs and goals, so what comes first, what comes next, responsivity factors, considerations of legal information, so what is their legal status, if they're pretrial, if they've been sentenced, where they're actually in the system, really looking to be strengths-based, and then also thinking of gender considerations, because we know with the high increase of women in the justice system that we need to have gender responses approaches to working with women. I'm gonna turn it back to Andre to talk some more about some of the other award requirements. Thanks, Sarah. 
As previously mentioned, there is an award special condition withholding for the planning phase. Each grant award will have in place a special condition withholding all but $150,000, which will allow grantees to complete, submit, and receive approval of their planning and implementation guides. The recipient may incur obligations, expend, and draw down funds in an amount not to exceed $150,000 for the sole purpose of completing the planning and implementation guide within 12 months of the project period start date. The grantee is not authorized to incur any additional obligations, make any additional expenditures, or draw down any additional funds until BJA has reviewed and approved the grant recipient's completed planning and implementation guide and has issued a grant adjustment notice removing this condition. The planning and implementation guide template will be provided by the National Rentry Resource Center, which is our technical assistance provider, which will help each grantee develop a strategic plan that incorporates systems enhancement for offenders with co-occurring substance abuse and mental illness. Cost sharing or match requirements are common questions the program office receives on grants. Note that this grant requires a match. Federal funds awarded under this program may not cover more than 75% of the total cost of the program being funded. The application must identify the source of the 25% for non-federal portions of the total program cost and how it be used to match the funds. If a successful applicant proposed match exceeds the required match requirement, the Office of Justice the Program will approve the budget and that total match becomes incorporated into the approved budget and becomes mandatory and subject to audit. Recipients may satisfy this match requirement with either cash or in-kind services. Please consult the Department of Justice Grants Financial Guide at the link in the slide for examples of in-kind services. This slide provides an example of the 75% match requirement for a federal award for $400,000. Based upon the calculations, the match award for this amount would be $133,333. The budget worksheet details should distinguish cash form and kind match funds. And for additional information on this and to answer any budget related questions, please see the DOJ Grants Financial Guide. It will be helpful to when putting together your budget. For this solicitation, BJA has designated the following application elements as critical. Your program narrative, your budget detail worksheet, and budget narrative. Please include the following and refer to the checklist on page 46 of the solicitation to help you to make sure you submit all the needed items with the grant. You will need the project abstract, the program narrative, the budget and associated documentation, financial management and system of internal controls questionnaire, disclosure of lobbying activities, applicant disclosure of pending applications, additional required attachments, letters of support or MOUs, mandatory certification and coordination requirement form, mandatory chief executive assurance to collect recidivism indicator data. Program components for CSAMI can be in the planning and or implementation phase. Your advisory group engagement, 
your standardized screening, CSAMI and criminogenic risk assessment, pre and post release CSAMI treatment and, and cognitive behavioral interventions, collaborative comprehensive case plan management with information sharing, performance measurement plan in partnership with an evaluator, and linked to recovery support services. The DOJ, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, put together some webinars to support your team in putting together a great application. We have a webinar on avoiding common application mistakes. It goes over the importance of using the application checklist, how applications are successfully submitted, how subawards can be incorporated into an application, and how to attach documents. I encourage you to watch this webinar to learn more. There are two additional webinars I think we've worked on with the National Reentry Resource Center, Winning Grants, Implementation and Organization Capacity, and Winning Grants, Writing Your Way to Success. These are all good resources to support your development of a strong application. There are several resources that we have mentioned in this webinar that can help, can be helpful to you in thinking through your application. Please make sure you go to the National Reentry Resource Center's website and the Collaborative Comprehensive Case Plan web base too. Thank you, Andre. So just for some additional information, these are really links that are gonna be helpful to you in your application process. There's the Department of Justice Financial Guide, and if you have any questions on allowable uses of funds, this is really important. There's also Department of Justice Financial Management trainings available online, which will provide additional information to you. You must register before submitting the application, and we really encourage people to register um, before, so that way you're not trying to register, wait for that to process, and then apply all in the same day. There's instructions on it at this link, and just a reminder that the applications are due June 25th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. If you need uh, help, grants.gov has a customer support line that is available as well as an email address that's seven days a week, except for the federal holidays. And if you have any unforeseen technical issues, you can contact the National Criminal Justice Reference Services available via web chat, via call, or via email. And they're open from 10 to 6 p.m. Eastern and 10 to 8 p.m. on the solicitation close day, which is the 25th. If you need a link to the solicitation, it is available here. And again, the applications are due June 25th. So now we're gonna go to questions and answers. To begin with the questions and answers, let me let you all know that this webinar is recorded and will be available online within the next few days. So for those of you who want access to this or, or the slide deck in order to prepare, those will be given to you. We have a number of questions already. If you have additional ones, feel free to chat it in the chat box and we will get to your questions. The first question is, would a nonprofit be eligible for this grant? They indicate they already partner with to provide therapy services for people who are incarcerated and are transitioning to the community. So Andre, are nonprofits eligible for the grant? No, no. And no, this grant is for state, local, and tribal governments. That is it. This is not the 501c3 grant. Thank you. Can funds be used for civil legal aid as an allowable use of funds through case management or recovery support services? That all depends. Civil legal aid is a very broad topic. There are select areas where Second Chance Act funding can be used, and there are many different areas, including suing the state or suing the county where it cannot be used. I think you want to govern yourselves according to the solicitation that has been written. 
Thank you. There's another question on the SSA requirements. Do tribal nations have to meet the SSA requirement to consult with the state to uh, consult with the state agency? Andre, or do you have thoughts on that? No, they don't. However, we 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 respect sovereignty, and we hope that you will collaborate with those state uh, entities, especially corrections that are in your, um, that are near your tribal jurisdictions and communities. We want to be respectful, but we understand that many times um, some of the returning citizens are coming back from state prisons back to their tribal nations. And so it would be helpful to sort of kind of coordinate what that transition could potentially look like. Thank you. So there's another question on the SSA requirement. Um, this question involves someone who's from the Department of Health, and they're wondering if they could be an eligible applicant if they coordinate with their mental health and addiction services from the state. We, we're not preventing anyone from applying. Based on eligibility, a state agency could apply. Nevertheless, it's not so much you coordinating with your behavioral health persons or contractors. I'd be more concerned about the MOU that would be necessary for you to conduct services inside a correctional facility. So that's the more important MOU that we should prefer, that you should be connecting with. So the answer is, sure, you can, come, can apply, pending that you have set up the correct systems alignment that goes with the Department of Corrections, knowing that we, the Department of Justice, work hand in hand with all of the DOCs around the nation. Thank you. There's actually a few questions that can be lumped together under the cost match. So I'll ask a couple of questions, um, allowing time for the answer, of course, but there will be a few that are on the cost match piece. The key so the here is, there. the thing is that, go ahead, go ahead, mm -hmm. no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, feel free to give your tip and then we can see if it answers the question. No, the thing is that the cost match is, is there. It's 25% of the entire amount that you're hoping to propose or that you're hoping to receive. So I, when you get into cost match situations, everyone, either you're going to do it or you're not. And if you're not going to do it, then you should try to submit a, a, a match waiver form. And so... What's the question? So the first question is on what documentation is needed for the required match. Would a letter of support or an MOU suffice it if it's another agency that's providing the match from the county you would or have to have that, state? Yes, you would have to have that spelled out in the MOU, but it is the county up front that should be putting off the match, the lead applicant. It should not be offset to your Medicaid provider or your, you know, your health care provider. No, the thing is it's actually the government that has to do the matching. Thank you. And the other question about the cost match was if you end up changing the source of funds that make up the match after the fact, does that have an effect? Of course, we want you to be intentional about where it's coming from. The funding should be coming from the lead agency. Should you have to re-examine where that 25% is coming from, that would be questionable. Thank you. So switching gears, the next question indicates that the solicitation asks for documentation on jurisdictions, regulations for coordinating with ICE. Could you explain that a bit more? And if there is a sanctuary city situation, how that would affect a proposal? It never mentions sanctuary cities, it mentions coordination. So if you are the applicant and you don't know that, then that means you're not at the helm of your agency to have a discussion. While you may be writing the grant, you should be informed by your leadership. So the question is not posed to me to explain, it's posed to the leadership and what is the right, what's happening within that particular state. So it's not so much the agency, you should find out what's happening in your state, what's happening in your county, and how are they looking at those kind of commitments as it relates to ICE.
Thank you so much. The next question is, is there a minimum for an applicant in terms of request of funding? No. You can request up to a million dollars. Thank you. So if anyone else has any additional questions, we're going to take one to two more questions. The, the, another question came up. It says, what are the most common expenses during the planning and implementation stage? So I can try to answer this and then Andre, you can jump in. So the planning and implementation stage really do, the funding does end up being what is laid out in the solicitation, so screening and assessment processes, case management, implementation of evidence-based practices for criminogenic risk and co-occurring substance abuse and mental illness, in some cases community supervision services or specialized caseloads, the evaluation and data collection piece, as well as convening advisory group and stakeholders. So I would say most of the expenses often are tied to what is laid out on the grant. Andre, can you think of other things I might have missed? No, I think you spoke directly to it. Thanks, Sarah. Great. There's another question that says, can a LEAGE agency be a criminal justice counsel? Again, yes, if that is an agency and your state, if you consider yourself an agency, certainly. However, you still will need the same kind of MOUs that connect the behavioral health, the contractor, if that's, what, if that's the practice in your particular state, and more importantly, the Department of Corrections, even if they fall under that criminal justice count. We need to make sure that all systems are aligned and that is determined by the application. Thank you. And the final question is, can, can we distinguish between how to identify a sub-award versus a contract for a research partner or what the differential is according to the application? No, that's inside your financial guide. You should govern yourselves to you look at the, the DOJ financial guide. There's a link inside of the end um, the solicitation that provides all the allowable costs as well as the definitions that are attached to uh, being a subcontractor versus a sub awardee. Thank you so much, Andre. We really appreciate it. If anyone has any additional questions, you can feel free to contact Andre Bathia at the Bureau of Justice Assistance or myself, Sarah Worsberg, at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. We'd also like to thank Kate Chinchester and Sean LaGrega from Cumberland County, Maine for sharing their experience and being a successful applicant for the program. We really do sincerely hope that everyone on the line applies for this grant and we look forward Department of Justice looks forward to the opportunity to review the applications. Thank you.